Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ramadan through this Ikra Bangla channel. Uh, inshallah, Allah make this Ramadan one of the best things that uh, we have had this year. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in this Ramadan. Ramadan is the time when so many different things are happening. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes some major changes in the whole universe. In the cosmic system, there's a whole change that's made. And that's why we're required to obviously adjust to those changes and take benefit of those changes. There's a hadith uh, that is reported by many of the um, scholars of hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when Ramadan enters, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up the doors of Jannah and he closes the doors of hellfire and he has the shaitans locked up. So this is a really interesting hadith that for this month of Ramadan, for this one month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. Shahr Ramadan, the month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an was revealed as well. So why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala close the doors of hellfire, open up the doors of paradise and lock up the shaitan? That's a very significant thing that Allah makes such a massive change, such a huge change that's made. So one of the reasons is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give as much opportunity as possible during this month on the smallest excuse Allah wants people to be able to go to Jannah. So it's in Ramadan, it's actually easier to get to Jannah than probably at any other time because Ramadan is open, the doors of Ramadan are opened up. So for example, if you've got a shop, it says that look, we've got lots of offers today, right? And the doors are open, all you have to do is just come in and, and take whatever you want, as much as you want. Now, the only person that's going to be deprived is a person who doesn't bother, who doesn't even bother trying, right? Because this is the time when Allah says the doors of Jannah are open, come in and come and make an effort, show that you want something and you will get whatever you want. Likewise, the doors of, the doors of hellfire are closed. And the purpose of the doors of hellfire being closed is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want people, it doesn't want to make it easy, wants to make it difficult for people to enter hellfire. So it closes the doors of hellfire. That means if somebody wants to go to hellfire, they'll probably have to break, break into hellfire, which means that you must be very serious that I want to go to hell to be able to go to hell in Ramadan, especially if you're a believer. You know, it'd be very difficult. And that's why we see the effects of this. Now, while we cannot see the doors of hellfire being closed because we don't see hellfire. Likewise, we don't see paradise, so we don't see the doors open. But I guarantee you most Muslims would feel that way. They feel different in Ramadan. You physically, mentally, psychologically, spiritually, you feel different. It's like the air is different, right? I mean, I noticed straight away after Maghrib on the first of Ramadan in the night when you know, they declare Ramadan, I just suddenly start feeling different. Right? I suddenly just start feeling different. SubhanAllah, it's just different. You just feel less inclined to doing anything wrong, to saying anything wrong. You kind of become a bit calmer. There's a massive difference. You see the effects of this in everything. You see the effects of this in, for example, how much food there is in Ramadan, how much blessing there's in Ramadan. Uh, people are so generous during this month of Ramadan. That's just a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's generosity. Right? People are so generous during this month of Ramadan that it's just a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gen uh, generosity. In fact, it says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to be the most generous in Ramadan, especially when Jibreel alayhi salam used to come and they used to revise the Qur'an together, meaning they used to review the, whatever had been revealed of the Qur'an until now. Prophet ﷺ used to recite it and have it checked uh, with Jibreel ﷺ. So Ramadan is a time when you actually feel a real difference, an ontological difference. You actually feel a difference in there, right? So having said that now, it's our opportunity to take advantage of that. Some of the other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds to this, He says, look, there's going to be obligations that you have to do anyway in Ramadan. So for example, we pray five times a day. Um, we have to fast in Ramadan. It's an obligation of Ramadan. And there's a lot of people who like to give their zakat in Ramadan as well. Zakat is not necessary in Ramadan. You know, it's, you should actually give it whenever it becomes due. 
Okay, I'll, I'll discuss that in a later in a later session, inshallah. But the, uh, a lot of people decide that they want to give zakat in Ramadan as well. So these are obligations, what we call fara'id, uh, fara'id in our in our religion. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to increase the reward of that. I'm going to give you seventy times the reward of a fard prayer. This is something nobody can give. This is some, you know, you got you got a shop where they, it's buy one get one free. If they're really generous, they might say buy one get two free. If they're trying to close the store and it's a closing down sale and they just want to get rid of things, they might say, you know, buy one get four free or five free or something like that. But nobody gives buy one get 70 free. That's just beyond any human capacity to, to be able to do that and to have endless supplies of this. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do this. Now, every one of you, every one of us here, every one of us can get 70 times the amount of reward. There's no the first 200 customers or the first 500 people or the first five people in the door. No, it's every single one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has abundance. And remember, this is something we have to do anyway as an obligation. Allah decides I'm going to give you 70 times the reward. Also, another thing I want to mention here is 70 in Arabic literature and in Hadith literature generally just means abundantly, like lots and lots. Because the Arabs at that time, especially, they used to use the concept of seven, right? Seven. 70, 700, 700,000. Nowadays, we use more the tens, the units, the metric system, you know, 10, uh, hundreds, thousands, millions, right? But generally, the more popular usage at that time was in sevens, and seven, seven actually compared to 10 is probably a more natural number. I know 10 is more even, but seven is, seven is a more natural number, and that's why you have the seven seas and the seven earths and the seven heavens and the seven days of the week, and we do tawaf seven times and so on. Seven is a much more natural number. So we get 70 times. That means abundantly, abundant reward. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much, especially since... The Prophet ﷺ said about fasting that fasting is for me and I will reward for it directly. SubhanAllah. But doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward for every deed that we do? He does. But the difference in fasting is that fasting is left to Allah to reward. There's no score sheet. So for every other worship, there could be a score sheet, meaning how many points you get for each worship you do that the angels have been given. So our angels, the kiram and katibin, the noble writers, they have a score sheet that if you wake up for salat, if you wake up for tahajjud, if you pray dhuhr prayer, if you give zakat, this is the rate of re minimum re reward you get. And then if you've done it with sincerity, you get this much more reward. And if you've done it with hardship, then this is much more reward and so on and so forth. When it comes to fasting, the angels say that's not our it's not our realm, we leave it to Allah. Now, obviously, if Allah has left something for Himself to give reward, and Allah is the most generous, and He has abundance, then you can imagine what kind of reward you would get for the fast of Ramadan. Thereafter, Allah says, you know, in Ramadan, if you do any optional worship, we're going to give you the same reward as you would get for a fard in any other time. Okay, so he's just there to give. He's just there to give. And then another hadith mentions that every night of Ramadan, there, there are people who are written as exonerated and freed from hellfire. It's the time. If you want to get to paradise, that's the time to focus on it. And if you really want to get interested in paradise, then you need to read more about paradise. I will tell you one thing. This is my understanding. And this is the understanding of some scholars is that the reason for paradise is to meet Allah. Paradise, yes, it has all of these great things in there and great rewards and amazing buildings and places to stay and spouses and all the rest of it. But the, one of the highest levels of happiness and joys in paradise is actually to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our most beloved, right? In every Friday, that is what's going to happen in paradise and that's why we want to get to paradise for because that's where it is promised that you will get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every week. Right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make, make that easy for us. Don't let it be such. Many Muslims say paradise, paradise, paradise. It's like somebody in Bangladesh right, who really wants to come to London, to the UK. So he's just like, London, I just want to come to London. I don't care where in London, I don't need to know that. Just drop me off on any seaside somewhere. You know, just drop me off in any place. I just want to be in London. Right? No, we need to review more about paradise so we know exactly where we want to be in paradise. And Ramadan is the time to attain that. Allah is giving us that option by opening the doors. And the last point in that hadith that I will mention, and inshallah this will help us to really put things in perspective for Ramadan, is that the shaitans are locked up. 
Now, to understand this, we need to know one thing first, which is that the two evil influences in our life, one is shaitan. He whispers, uh, as we seek, forgive, uh, we seek refuge in, from shaitan, min sharril waswasil khannas. The shaitan is the waswas and the khannas, which means that he's the one who whispers, gives ideas in our mind, bad ideas, obviously. Al khannas, but then he retreats. As soon as we make the dhikr of Allah, he retreats. Alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas, the one who whispers into the hearts of people. Actually, the word is sadr, the breasts of people, the chests of people. That's why the ulama writes here that if, it, if Allah had said qulubin nas, like shaitan whispers directly into the hearts of people, then we'd have no choice. Because everything in our heart is what we do. Once you've got something in your heart, that's what you do it generally. So it's the chest area, not the exactly inside the heart. It's our, it's our decision to accept it into the heart or reject it, right? So he whispers into the heart. That's the first, that's the first and most common effect on a human being of evil. The second one is the nafs, is the inside ego. Shaitan gets us to do things, then we become used to doing those things. We become addicted to doing those things. And then when that happens, the nafs makes us do things. For example, in Ramadan, the shaitan is supposed to be locked up. But some people will say, we still feel like doing some bad deeds. I thought the shaitan was supposed to be locked up. He is locked up. But the difference is that I want you, this Ram I want you in these days of Ramadan to check. If you ever feel like doing something bad, you will notice that it's going to be never something new. It's always going to be something we're used to doing or have a habit of doing. Because it's not the shaitan who's making us do it now. Shaitan's out of the picture. He's locked up. It's our nafs. All right? It's our nafs. What that means is shaitan will never, shaitan, because he's not there, he will not give us new ideas. There's, I don't think there's anybody who, for example, has never listened to music when going for work. Right? And suddenly in Ramadan, he decides, you know what, let me just listen to some music because it's Ramadan. That's crazy. That idea from shaitan could not come in Ramadan generally. If you feel like doing a bad thing in Ramadan or when you're inside prayer, it's going to be a habit that's kicking in. Right? That's all shaitan has to do. Shaitan just has to give a whisper. And because our shaitan has been with us from our birth, because every human being that's born is given a shaitan. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a shaitan with him as well. But the Prophet said that my shaitan has been subdued, submitted. He can't do anything, basically he can't do anything wrong to the Prophet sallallahu That's why our shaitan knows us more than anybody else. And you have to remember, shaitan is one for every human being. It's not one for every family, that one for the Uddin family and one for the Al-Islam family and one for Habiganj and one for Bishnat and one for Olifur and you know all the rest of it. It's one person for every single individual. And he's been with us since birth, so he knows exactly what makes us react in a negative way. When he gives us a feeling, a thought about certain things, or he knows that when we meet somebody that uh, we generally argue with, then he gives us a thought or reminds us of something bad with them. So that's why we have to be very careful. But the good thing is, Ramadan, the shaitan is gone. So it's the nafs, it's our addiction that's, uh, that creeps in where we still feel like doing bad deeds. But that's the beauty of Ramadan. Now in Ramadan, what we're supposed to do is fast. So fasting, uh, we are supposed to avoid eating drinking and sexual intercourse with our spouses during the month of Ramadan. These three things are halal at other times. Even in the evening, it's halal after iftar. It's halal to do this. But in the daytime, it's not. What's the benefit of this? Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O people who believe, for you fasting has been prescribed. Kutiba alaykum as siyam Just as it was prescribed on the people before you, la'allakum tattaqoon, so that you can gain taqwa, God-fearingness. Right? How do you do that? Well, the, one of the impediments and obstacles in the path of our reaching taqwa and God-fearingness is our nafs because it is addicted to certain things. So we feel like it's like a smoker. The, the person who got us into smoking, maybe a friend or something, is long gone but we continue to smoke and people find it difficult because it's an addiction. So Ramadan is the time to kick addictions. Smoking and other evil acts, other wrong acts. 
haram discussions with people, haram viewing, uh, haram uh, thoughts, whatever it is that we are addicted to. Why? Because what happens is that when we're told to stop eating and drinking and sexual intercourse, which are halal generally in the evening and other times, it's like I come to work and at 10 o'clock, 10.30, I like to have a cup of tea or a coffee because I feel a bit down after you know the morning breakfast. So I'm about to go and get a tea or a coffee, but what happens is that um, I suddenly feel like, oh, I'm fasting, I can't have tea, or I can't have the coffee. Uh, I'll start feeling tired, the nafs will make me feel tired, it'll make me feel sad, it'll make me feel uh, weary and, and, and angry and all the rest of it. But I say, no, you can't. So I've subdued the nafs for today. Tomorrow it may ask again, but it will be easier for me to, this nafs is very easy to subdue once you start trying to subdue it. After three, four days, you don't even feel like having a coffee. Your nafs will say, uh, nafs will not ask you for coffee. Problem is, after Ramadan, we go back to doing the same thing wrong. It's like Ramadan, okay, I'm going to try to be pious. After Ramadan, I go back to doing the same thing. That's why it doesn't benefit us. What we're supposed to do is that if before Ramadan we are 5 out of 10, if I give a grading to our Iman, like if we're 5 out of 10, in Ramadan generally people push it up, they get to 7, 8, 9, maybe even 10 out of 10 in terms of their worship and how careful they are. After Ramadan, if you're going to drop back to 5 out of 10, then we've not achieved much. That's why what we need to do is we need to stay after Ramadan to the higher level, even if it drops slightly. So if before Ramadan we were five, in Ramadan we became to nine, eight or nine. After Ramadan, don't go back to five. At least go to seven maybe, six, but don't go to five. And then inshallah, as we carry on, the further Ramadans we have, the higher we will get so that inshallah we are close to Allah before we die. So now to finish off, I'm going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this Ramadan, may Allah, Ya Allah, make this Ramadan for all of us better than any Ramadan before it. We've done maybe many Ramadans before it. This one's going to be different and I'm going to do a lot more this time and I want to really get close to you and don't let me be further from you now after you've given us this Ramadan. Keep us close to you as well, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, accept it from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our worships during this month. May Allah bless you all and keep us in your du'as as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.